At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial grade supplies for every industry with same day pickup and next day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help. So you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Brian Elliott, Sheila Subramanian, and Helen Cup about the importance of flexible design in the future of work. Hello, Future Forum team. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks, John, for having us. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. We have a crowded screen today. Uh, We have three amazing guests. Uh, For me and my audience, I really appreciate all three of you taking the time out of your busy schedules to meet with me and my audience to talk about all things related to flexible design in the future of work. And you have a recent report out from the Future Forum where you have done uh, some really great work. And we're going to unpack that and talk more about that together as well. As we get started, I wanted to share the three of your bios with everybody. Brian Elliott is executive leader of Future Forum. He has spent three decades leading teams and building companies as a startup CEO, as a product leader at Google, and now at Slack, where he's a senior VP. Brian started his career at Boston Consulting Group and earned his MBA from Harvard Business School. His work has been published in Harvard Business Review, Fortune, and The Economist, and he is the proud father of two young men. Sheila Subramanian is vice president and co-founder of Future Forum. She holds 20 years of experience building high growth global teams across Google, Slack, and startup organizations. As a champion for workplace equity, her work is cited in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, and other top-tier publications. Sheila earned her BA from Stanford University and MBA from Harvard Business School and is the mother to two magical daughters. Helen Cup is a co-founder and senior director of Future Forum. She has led many of Slack's largest cross-functional and growth initiatives and is the creator of many of Future Forum's playbooks, tapping Future Forum's research and networks along with her experience at Slack, Bain & Company Startups, and her MBA from Harvard Business School. She also is the lucky mom of two wonderful children. Uh, Again, pleasure to have all three of you joining me today. Uh, Wonderful backgrounds. Uh, you bring so much to the table and uh, all three of you are parents and have wonderful children. I always think that's a wonderful uh, component uh, as we balance out our hectic lives and, and try to seek uh, balance in what we do. Um, as we get started, before we dive on in and talk, start talking about flexible design, uh, anything else any of you would like to share with me or my audience by way of your background, your personal context, or anything else that can help to frame up the conversation today? Nothing is top of mind, but we're excited to dig into the conversation today. Okay, wonderful. Well, as we get started, let's uh, just really start with your future form research. It suggests that flexible work is almost as important as compensation when it comes to what employees are wanting, what they're needing, what they're really demanding. Why do you think that's the case? How do you think the the pandemic has played into that uh, and the kind of shift that we've been seeing happening in uh, the perspectives of employees 
uh, and the labor force as a whole? Yeah, I think so much of the conversation today about flexibility is the number of days you're asking people to come back into the office. But ultimately, what we're seeing from our research and conversations with executives is that flexibility is about choice. What people want is more choice in not just where they work, but also when they work and ultimately how they work. I oftentimes say that the future of work is about trust. And as we're at this interesting juncture point, two and a half years into the pandemic or uh, into this experiment in terms of how we're working, um, so many leaders in the past have relied on command and control models of management and leadership. And what I see moving forward is that the expectation from employees is that they're going to be treated like adults and that leaders are going to lead with trust rather than control. And I think that needs to be the point of conversation moving forward. I think part of it also is that um, there were so many myths that we held on to about work and working in the office. And I think the last two and a half years gave us an opportunity to dispel a lot of those myths. Um, and, you know, there are some assumptions that we we used to think, oh, we have to be in the office to work together. Oh, we have to be in the office to innovate and, and be creative. And when we were forced into a working model that was very different, I think we found that actually we could do work, we could be creative in the same ways um, in, you know, uh, not having to be together in the office all the time. Um, and so those, I think that that is a big, big part of what has happened as well. Would you like to add anything to that, Brian? I think the other thing that it has done is for some leaders, at least, it's actually changed their own mindset. So for people who grew up spending decades, not only believing that nine to five in the office was the way that work worked, but also that you um, really couldn't find ways to trust your team as Sheila was getting into to actually do the, the work in the, in the right way. Um, it's really been an eye opener. And for a lot of organizations, that's actually led to a series of other changes because now you don't have to sit there and assume that the only place that I can recruit people is from folks that are willing to make that commute every single day into an office. And that opens the door, not only in terms of you know geographic aperture of where all you can recruit folks, but actually much more diverse populations that you can recruit from. Some of that goes to where people live uh, and the fact that people across race and ethnicity, if you look at the United States, are spread out uh, in different pockets in different places. But it also goes to the demands that are put on, in particular, uh, caregivers, women with children, uh, people who have different needs and ways in which they have to balance out their lives. The ability to get those people just as engaged as the people who are willing to do that nine to five, five days a week, in your organization is a real game changer from an organizational perspective as well. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the potential for flexible work arrangements, virtual, uh, remote work, hybrid work to really help with the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging conversations within organizations is huge. Lots of potential there. I'm not sure we're really tapping into that potential yet in most organizations, uh, but it's it's a really great opportunity. And you mentioned, Sheila, how important it is to think about flexible work, not just in terms of where we work, but also when we work, how we work. Uh, really, all of those components go into uh, what we're trying to do. And Helen, you mentioned too, just the the rethinking of assumptions, uh, what, what we took for granted about how work should be, quote unquote, how it should be, how organizations have traditionally run. Um, the last couple of years, I think most of us have really questioned a lot of those assumptions. And we've realized that most of the ways things were uh, certainly don't need to remain that way. And in, in many cases, they were counter- uh, productive in in terms of how we could maximize our potential, uh, and certainly as it relates back to the the complex demands that we have in our lives as we're trying to juggle all sorts of things. So I remember early on in the pandemic, you know, there were these reports coming out about uh, women, for example, being disproportionately negatively impacted by the pandemic, and how we're setting women's equality in the workplace back a generation, and and these types of uh, reports. Anything else um, that you would like to say about that, and maybe how things have um, shifted over the last couple of years as we've leaned more into remote and virtual work? There's a lot to say say there. And you, you pointed out women as well. Yes, the, the she session happened um, and it's still happening. And the uh, women's participation, women's participation in the workforce is the lowest it's been in 30 years. It's it's really um in a bad spot. And I think so much of it is back to Helen's point of the way that we have worked has worked for a select few rather than all employees. And it was designed by a homogenous group of people who were thinking about what works best for them rather than actually thinking about 
um, the diversity of their teams. And since the racial reckoning of 2020, what we have seen is that more leaders are committing to diversity, equity, and inclusion, but the request is to move beyond ERGs and CEO statements to actually thinking about how do you make a culture more inclusive? And I think flexibility is one step in that direction. What we've seen from our research is that those who work in flexible work environments, those who are um, employees of color in the U.S., um, who are working in flexible working or, um, environments, experience higher sense of belonging, as well as better relationships with coworkers. And as we dug more into that research, when we first saw it in partnership with um, Brian Lowry, a professor at Stanford, one thing that he noted was that flexible work arrangements also help people deal with code switching. Code switching is the act of changing your behavior, the way that you dress, what you eat, the way that you talk, in order to fit into the prevailing norm, which was designed by a homogenous group of people. Um, whereas flexible work enables people to bring more of their whole selves to work and also focus on the work at hand rather than, um, rather than trying to fit in. So I think that's a really important point to acknowledge as we're thinking about building more inclusive environments and, and how flexibility offers that. Um, Brian, I think it's also worth talking about quiet quitting. It's a phrase that we're, we're hearing a lot right now um, that I think all of us take issue with in some form. Part of that is back to, you know, the, the phrase quiet quitting is is sort of a derogatory phrase around the fact that a lot of people who are sitting there going, I've spent the last two years proving to you that I can actually be highly productive and effective working from home and get my job done. And there's two things that are happening. One is people are reconsidering the balance of work in their lives and the extracurriculars that you want to pile on top of me that actually aren't core to my job and quite often actually fall, well, more often fall to women in the workplace, um, often unfairly. And these are the unrewarded tasks of running a diversity, equity, and inclusion working group, as an example. Right. Um, those types of extracurriculars are the sorts of things that people are saying, no, thanks. I'm here to do my job, and I'm going to be effective and drive the outcomes you want me to drive. But the extracurriculars are not something that I'm signing up for. And what you're seeing is management reaction to that, which is you know, usually contrary to, the, to you know, what they're actually trying to accomplish, which is managers are sitting there saying, well, then what we're going to do is we're going to get you back in the office so that you feel like you're more engaged with the organization, so that you feel a bigger sense of buy-in uh, with all of us. That's not the issue. The issue is there's a series of people that have made this reconsideration about what balance they're looking for in the first place. And they are being highly effective and driving the outcomes you want them to drive. And what they're asking for is to be considered on the basis of the outcomes that they create, not on whether they show up at eight o'clock in the morning and leave at eight o'clock at night, proving that they are hard workers and they're for the hustle culture. So for every contrary reaction managers have to quiet quitting, they're just gonna make the problem worse. Yeah, I mean, one thing that we talk a lot about is as we see leaders put mandates out there about coming back into the office and the need to be full time, what we're going to end up seeing is that this is going to actually make your diversity, equity, inclusion efforts right. worse. It's going to cause either proximity bias or as we see in the data, because there have been more benefits for traditionally underrepresented people at the at work who want flexibility because of increased sense of belonging, because of just being able to better fit work into their lives, they're the ones who are also choosing flexibility more. So as you create these mandates, you're widening that gap between who's able to come in or who wants to come in versus those who don't. And if you're not thoughtful and intentional about how to design work in a way that preserves that equity and creates that safe and inclusive environment, you're going to create a lot more proximity bias um, as we see more and more people open offices and, and return. Well, and I think uh, to, to all of your points, I see a huge gendered bias in this whole concept of quiet quitting. <laughs> and it really bothers me. Uh, yeah, I, I think the whole concept is, is potentially problematic. Uh, from a whole bunch of different angles, you're all nodding your heads. So I think you agree. But I mean, I don't see a lot of men being asked to do all of these extra little things that disproportionately women are being asked to do. And and historically, traditionally, women have just kind of sucked it up and just kind of done it because they felt like they had to, or that's kind of what was expected to be able to move forward in their career. And and now they're just saying no. I mean, they're just putting up boundaries and just saying no. That's not part of my job. Uh, you know, it's not. I think one thing that has 
we've also seen over the last couple of years is the, the pendulum is continually being has continually been swung towards less commitment and loyalty, both directions from employer to employee. And there were certainly many organizations that did a really great job during the pandemic to demonstrate compassion and empathy towards their people and support towards their people. But there were just as many companies, if not more, uh, that were terrible uh, towards their people during the pandemic. And you know, if it let's let's just thought experiment here for a second. I'm and I'm a I'm a straight cisgender white dude, and so you know I have all the layers of privilege. But let's just say for a moment that I'm I'm not that, and I'm something else uh, from say a few years back. And I, I'm hustling. I'm I'm working my butt off. I'm in the office. I'm doing every last little thing anyone ever asked me to do because I'm trying to be a team player. I'm trying to demonstrate my worth and my value. Uh, and now the pandemic comes, and now. I'm having my contributions constantly questioned. I'm, uh, I have a boss that's trying to micromanage me. I have uh, an organization that's laying people off or furloughing people. So my job isn't safe or secure. And now we're kind of getting past that a little bit and, and we're being requested to come back into the office. And now I'm just wondering, my, my company has already demonstrated that me going above and beyond doesn't actually matter. It doesn't actually count for much of anything. It doesn't secure me that promotion. It doesn't secure me security um, in, in my job. And over the last couple of years, now I've been able to reprioritize what's most important to me. Of course, wouldn't I rebalance the scales at that point, set up some boundaries and defend them, right? That's what I see when I see people talking about quiet, quiet quitting. And so I just find it super frustrating that we're framing it that way. I think it's perfectly normal and healthy for people to recalibrate and do what makes sense for them in their lives, especially in a tight labor market. I mean, I, as an employee, I have power, I have choice, and I don't have to put up with, with uh, endless demands, often frivolous or kind of just strange demands from my employer, just because they have a thought, right? You, you, what you just said was spot on. And, and what we're seeing from the research too, that re- reflects that. Um, 70% of people who are not happy with their current levels of flexibility, they're open to looking for that new job in the next year. And so oftentimes I hear executives say they pair the great resignation or quiet quitting with nobody wants to work anymore. And I take issue with that point because it's no, people want to work, but they don't want to work on outdated norms. They don't want to work against your terms anymore. They want to have more voice. Um, I, I recently reread Tony Morrison's piece on, on work-life balance. And, and one thing that she says is, you are not the work that you, you do, you are the person that you are. And I think for decades of people being defined by the work, defined by going into the office and having their entire communities built around their colleagues, to have a two and a half year respite from that and realizing, wow, there's a community beyond my office. I can fill out, fill that office shape hole with my neighbors and my um, my kids' school, et cetera. People have gotten a lot more fulfillment out of that and they're willing to walk if they're not necessarily being trusted by their leaders and they're being asked to come back five days a week with no answer to the why. Or a really bad answer to the why, right? Or, or a bad answer, yeah. But part of this also goes back to you know senior leaders, myself included, John, not that different from you that grew up with the experience of the way in which you would lead and inspire teams is that you do the raw raw in the office, right? You get everybody together and you stand up and you, you do the, the shouting uh, type of thing. And you go from office to office and, and meet with people. We now have two generations of digital natives in the office as well, right? And so we have people that are very used to finding ways to build and bridge relationships that involve both in real life as well as digital ways of, of connecting. And a lot of those people have spent two years creating new and different connections than the dependence on the office is the way that I actually get my social network. And I think as senior leaders, it's it's hard. It's challenging because the the tools that you rely on to get excitement going in your organization that you used two, two and a half years ago no longer work in the way that you would expect them to. One of the things that's really interesting in our research, though, is that there's an assumption that executives have that sense of belonging with my team is driven off that rah-rah of getting people together, right? It's not true. What we see in the research is that sense of belonging with my team actually uh, has almost nothing to do with where they're located. It has a lot more to do with whether or not I trust my management, which when you think about it, we all kind of get that. If I know and trust my team, if I've got psychological safety with my the people that I work with day in and day out, and importantly with my manager, then I'm much more likely to feel like I belong here than if you're getting me to show up for the you know cheerleading conversation.
You know, one yeah. of the things we say a lot is um, we used to we used to try to fit our lives into work, but now we have an opportunity to rethink how work fits into our lives. Um, and I can tell you a different perspective from not just being a mom with two very young kids, but I've always been the introvert in the room, deeply introverted, despite what I do with these podcasts and speaking. Um, and for the most part in, in my career, the feedback and the advice I'd ever gotten was you have to just jump in, be part of the conversation, interrupt other people. Um, and that was the way to operate. How do I fit who I was into the standard of work that worked for everyone else? And with the pandemic and with us finding new ways of working together and thinking about how to bring more, more voices to the conversation, it's actually been better as an introvert to participate. Like one of the things that we say a lot is instead of brainstorming in a room, how about we try brain writing and actually taking the time to jot down ideas in a document before jumping into discussion. That format not only works better for not having large meetings where not a lot is getting done or that there's too much group think, it actually does provide an, an opportunity for folks who are busy with young kids crawling all over you, or if you're more introverted, to take the time to add your ideas before diving into discussions. So when we think about that opportunity to rethink how people are working together, that's what we're talking about, not just breaking the assumptions of what, you know, what the office was, but actually thinking, does this, does this actually work? And can we do this better? Yeah. How we interact, how we communicate. I'm the same way, Helen, I'm an introvert. Uh, I do plenty of public speaking. I do things like this podcast. I'm a professor. I teach, you know, I'm in front of people a lot, but I'm an introvert. And in meetings, I tend to be the observer, the one kind of sitting back soaking in and every now and then we'll make a comment. Um, and I have found just like you that in remote kind of meeting situations, I'm much more likely um, to uh, to contribute in meaningful ways, in, in ways that other people um, can can see the contribution. Uh, and, and so I, I, I think that's another huge value. So we talk about the diversity, equity, inclusion stuff. If, if we extend that to cognitive diversity, personality diversity, style diversity, like all those things, right? It just, there, there's so many potential positives uh, as we learn how to do this and learn how to do it better. Uh, maybe we'll end the conversation today. And I know there's so much we could talk about. We could go on and on and on, but maybe we'll end today by just talking about a few ideas that leaders can start doing right now today, this week to help their teams and their organizations lean into the flexible approach to work design, uh, to how they have their people uh, fill out their, their roles and the requirements of the work, how they collaborate with each other and such so that we can start the ball rolling in a positive direction. Um, I'll, I'll start and then please feel free to add Brian and Sheila. Um, I think the first thing is just to acknowledge that there isn't a blueprint for the future of work or flexible work, that it is an experiment and for leaders to acknowledge that with their teams and say, let's build this together. We are going to experiment our way through it and try different things and see what works. And that may change as the team changes and we grow. Um, but I think creating a mindset and safety to experiment is a first step. I love that, Helen. And that's, that's one of the steps in our book. Um, I think one area that I encourage leaders to experiment around is meetings. When we talk about flexibility, when we talk about choice in terms of how you're working, the response I oftentimes get is like, well, we have so many meetings. How do we have flexibility in when we work? And I encourage leaders to really reevaluate the role of meetings within their organizations. And the framework that we've developed at Future Forum is the 4D framework. The meeting should be to debate something specific, decide, discuss something specific, or develop your employee. If it's something else, bring it into your digital channels. And, um, and using that framework, as well as potentially even doing intentional things like uh, declaring calendar bankruptcy, where you're canceling all the meetings in your calendar, are good ways to set the tone that you don't necessarily need a meeting to do business or to do work at your organization. And you can offer up more flexibility and more choice to your employee as a result. And the thing I build on top of both of those with is, is how you do it. So as senior leaders, it's often, you know, the decision gets made at the top. Matter of fact, in our own research, about two thirds of executives say they're doing their future of work planning with little to no 
direct input of their organizations. And you can see then why their teams don't believe that they're being transparent. And by the way, if I don't believe that my leader is being transparent about their, their future work plans, I am more than three times more likely to be looking for a new job because I just don't, you know, trust that, that you're actually going to take my needs into consideration. So what we talk about a lot is the need to build up task forces, groups of people that are representative across functions, across geographies, and really critically across demographics of your organization that can bring ideas forward because often the best ideas don't come from the top, surprise, surprise. They actually come from a part of your organization that's already doing some of what Helen was describing in terms of the experimentation, the iteration, and innovating within their own team. Those types of ideas can actually be broadly applied across the rest of the organization. And often the champions you're looking for within a t within an organization sit there already today. Uh, celebrating their successes and using them to help you build that blueprint is really essential. And it generates the buy-in that you need as senior leaders to really drive it home. Yeah. And it's kind of crazy to think that you'd be having these conversations around the future of work and not including the people who are doing that work, doesn't it? Yet you're absolutely right. That's, that's the norm. That's super common. Um, and, and I don't think it's because of necessarily bad intentions. I don't think most leaders are sitting around thinking, how can I really, uh, screw over my people and how, you know, like the, the, the devious, um, villain person in the organization. I don't think most, uh, leaders are like that. They, they have good intentions. Uh, it's just clumsy. They're not, uh, generating the buy-in. Uh, they're not getting the input that they need to get. So of course that's important. Uh, if we're shifting the way we work, how, when we work, et cetera, we have to have these open conversations and dialogues with our people to make sure that we're doing something that meets our needs as an organization, but also the needs of our employees, both future, uh, present and future employees. Well, thank you all, Helen, Brian, and Sheila. This has been a fun conversation. I know at the time I need to let you jump, but before we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with my audience how they can connect with you, find out more about the future forum, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yes, you can um, follow us on Twitter as well as on LinkedIn at Future Forum, as well as if you're interested in learning more about the research, uh, as well as some of the insights that we share today, futureforum.com. And um, if you're interested in reading the book, How the Future Works, uh, you can go to howthefutureworks.org or find the book at your local bookstore or on Amazon. Um, one final insight for the day is uh, I would say lead with trust, trust your employees, treat them like the adults that they are, and make sure that you actually ask for their feedback, listen to them, and get those insights as you're crafting your future work plans. And the best way to get there to give everybody aligned is focused on focus on outcomes, not attendance. Getting alignment about what outcomes you're trying to drive as a team, what ex what individuals' expectations are, is a great way to drive better results as an organization, as well as a more level playing field for the people that are in that team. And also a good opportunity to relook at how you're supporting your frontline managers, who are really the ones making this happen. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks to each of you for taking time out of your busy schedules, for sharing your insights with me and my audience. And I would encourage everyone to reach out, get connected with the Future Forum, check out the book. As always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial-grade supplies for every industry with same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help. So you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.